Morgan's love of nature leads to a PhD in biology. Then in 1903, while teaching at Bryn Mawr College, Morgan hears exciting news. Hugo de Vries, a Dutch biologist, discovers what appears to be a new species of plant growing right alongside its parent, originally thought to be produced by a single large mutation. When Morgan read de Vries's work, he felt that might be the answer to the problem that he didn't think Darwin had solved, which is how you get from one species to a second very different species. Morgan was a zoologist, and he decided he was going to try to generate and find those kind of mutations in animals. Morgan chooses the common fruit fly, known as Drosophila, for his experiments. It's a perfect choice. A female fly will produce two, three hundred progeny easily. Secondly, they're easy to raise. You can raise them on a simple medium. You could grow them on mashed bananas. A third, you could separate males from females easily. The life cycle was short, so that in a matter of 10, 12, 13 days, depending upon the temperature, you had a generation of flies. So we started out just looking for mutations. The work of sorting through thousands of tiny insects in search of mutations is extremely laborious. And it seems futile. For several years, he didn't get any fruit flies that looked substantially different from their parents, and he was just about to give up the experiment. In fact, he wrote to a colleague uh, in Europe and said, you know, I've just about had it with these uh, fruit flies. They're not producing anything. It's been several years of work, and I'm just going to abandon it and go on to something else. And just shortly after that, uh, he discovered in his culture one white-eyed male fruit fly. Finally, a mutation. Not a new species, but Morgan is intrigued. Instead of looking for large-scale, De Vries-like mutations that might drive evolution, he decides to investigate small variations, like the white eye. He breeds the white-eyed male to a normal red-eyed female. Will the mutation be passed on to the next generation, making the offspring white-eyed? Or will they have normal red eyes? or even show a blend of red and white and have pink eyes. There was no consensus about how inheritance worked. No one really knew how traits were passed on, whether there were any patterns or laws. Uh, it was clear that like begets like, that offspring look somewhat like their parents, but sometimes they look like their grandparents, or sometimes their great-grandparents, or sometimes like no one in the family. And there were about as many theories, as one author said, of heredity as there were people proposing them. The work of Gregor Mendel, however, stands out. Mendel had found that when he bred tall plants with short, the first generation, the F1s, all turned out tall. But some short plants reappeared in the next generation, in a ratio of about three tall to one short. Mendel concluded that among those three quarters that were tall, two contained both tall and short characteristics, but the tall was masking the short. Mendel believed that all the plant's characteristics were controlled by some factor from each parent that was passed on to the next generation, and that these factors, later called genes, never blended together to form new ones. They remained discrete, determining the characteristics of offspring by their different combinations. Although Mendel laid out genetics very clearly in 1865, it really didn't catch on. I think the, the paper was largely ignored for the next 35 years. I think the reason is that although this abstract concept of factors or genes controlling inheritance was an interesting one, hard-headed biologists would say, well, where are the genes? Can you show them to me? There was nothing physical to see about genes. Morgan is aware of Mendel's work, but remains skeptical. He asked a very simple question. What are these things that 
mental call factors. How are they transmitted from one generation to the next? What's the basis for all of this? Are these units? Are they single? Are, they, are there multiples? What's going on here? By 1910, Morgan and his wife Lillian, also a notable biologist, have produced a new generation of Morgans. They call them their F1s. They spend their summers in Woods Hole, Massachusetts, where Morgan builds a big house half a mile from the ocean. The Morgans will summer at Woods Hole for the next 40 years. Every summer they would pack up these milk bottles full of fruit flies and bring them up to the Marine Biological Laboratory in Woods Hole and work with them and do their breeding and do their cataloging experiments here. Morgan would take his group out on the lawn outside of one of the laboratories at the Marine Biological Lab and they would simply lie on the grass and talk about their day's results or the week's breeding figures and so on. Back in New York City, Morgan's breeding experiments with his white-eyed fly begin to show the kind of results Mendel's theories predict. He bred this white-eyed fly to a red-eyed fly and looked at the offspring. And all the offspring were red-eyed. But then he asked, you know, being familiar with Mendel's work, he thought, well, now Mendel observed that with his peas, that all the offspring of the first cross looked alike. So what happens if you cross those with each other? He did that, and lo and behold, he got about 25% white-eyed. But then he noticed something that was really peculiar. Every one of those flies was a male. How come only males? Why not females? Then he did a little thinking, and he said, what in a fly, or what in any animal, starting from the grandfather, will end up in a grandson? What's the only thing? A clue lay in a discovery of the late 19th century, when biologists had seen pairs of long, thread-like structures in the nuclei of cells. They called them chromosomes, after the Greek word for color, since these structures absorbed dye readily and stood out clearly under the microscope. They found that a particular configuration of chromosomes seems to have a role in determining sex. And since the white eye only shows up in males, Morgan suggests that perhaps a Mendelian factor for eye color is associated with the chromosome configuration that determines maleness. Morgan did not go as far as to say that this factor for eye color was actually physically a part of the chromosome, just that it always appeared with it in the offspring. Within a year, uh, Morgan had found several other characteristics that also seemed to be sex-linked. And at that point, he was willing to say that the factors determining these particular traits were actually physically part of the chromosome itself. So he published a paper, and he postulated that the white eye gene, if there is such a thing, must be on the chromosome. That was the big step. Morgan continues searching for more traits that are linked to convince himself that factors of inheritance, genes, are physically located on chromosomes. It is tedious, exacting work that can only be done with a devoted team of researchers. In the Morgan lab, there was a congeniality, a give and take. It uh, generated the kind of thinking which was necessary to do these crucial experiments. And uh, Morgan let people, you know, f gave him free license. Very few research projects at that time were done in groups. And Morgan's group of young undergraduates and then later graduate students became the prototype of a whole new way of doing science. Compared to the European tradition where the professor in charge of a lab was very austere, very standoff, he should maybe come through the lab once a day and talk to a few people about what they were doing. 
Morgan was just the opposite. He sat at his own desk in the fly room. He had his own microscope. He would count flies along with everybody else. There was a tremendous amount of informality. Morgan and his team study over 13 million flies. Gradually, during the early 1920s, a genetic map of Drosophila starts to emerge. They begin to understand where, on the chromosome, genes for particular traits are located. And they became convinced now that you were dealing with a material particle that was indeed passed on from generation to generation during the period of cell division. This gave them a sense that now they were gaining an understanding of how heredity could occur in material fashion and in such fashion that you could alter it in the laboratory and predict the outcomes. Morgan gave rise in his lab at Columbia to a whole school of geneticists that laid down all the fundamental rules of heredity that shaped the rest of the century, including all the fundamental rules we apply today in human genetics. But what the genetic material was, how it was organized in the chromosome, precisely how the chromosomes replicate and how you replicated the genetic material, and what it actually does in the developmental process, that was a black box. Scientists knew that what was in the black box could in some way be called the secret of life. The beauty and wonder of life itself the incredible diversity that had puzzled and intrigued Darwin and Morgan. Could this be reduced to chemistry? Understanding the chemical basis of life had become the ultimate challenge for many scientists. <laughs> 